My name is David, I'm 44 years old, and this is the testimony of how Jesus Christ saved me from 27 years of homosexuality. I speak these things in love, not out of hatred. I speak these things out of somebody who's been there, who knows what it's like, who, who knows what it's like to, to live in that, who knows how hopeless it is. Sure, you may enjoy your life, you may enjoy aspects of your life, you may enjoy the sexual aspects of it, the alcohol, what have you, but, but there's really no permanent joy in it. Eventually it goes away and you have to do more, you have to seek more. So I ask you to look for the real love, the real joy, the real contentment that can only be found in being made right with God through Christ, through Christ's work on the cross. So I speak these things from love, not, not from hate. I, I speak these things not in judgment. You know, I, I'm not judging somebody. I'm, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God is what's going to judge us. In fact, the Word of God is what says all these things are wrong. I'm only telling people what the Word of God says. Like somebody should have told me, my friend who did try to tell me, he tried to tell me in the, in the nicest way, in a Christian way, that I was living a lifestyle that was contrary to what God wanted, not just in my, my sexual orientation, but in every other aspect. He knew, I, he knew I was not really a Christian. So I speak these things in love, and I, I pray for your soul, and I pray that you will receive these things and that you will cry out to the Lord to save you and to make you a new creature because he is mighty to save and he will save you. As I turned into my teens, we stopped going uh, quite as much. My parents started having problems and, um, and eventually my parents divorced and sometime later my mom remarried. And after she was remarried, we started going back to church again. And I remember being kind of glad that I was going back to church, but it was all superficial. I, I would listen to the hymns and get emotional. And about that time, my friends started going down front and making professions of faith. And so one Sunday, I was moved by feelings and by the music and what my friends had done. And I went down front and made a decision for Christ. I didn't really know what I was doing or understand what was really taking place. I just knew something was wrong. And all my friends had done it, so I felt compelled to do it. So I walked down front and I sat down in the front pew and the deacon came over and told me I needed to accept Jesus into my heart and he told me to repeat this prayer. And I, I repeated the prayer and I remember thinking, you know, is that all there is to it? And the next thing I know, he's clapping me on the back and standing me up in front of the congregation and telling me that I'm saved. And everybody congratulated me on the way out. We all left and went to, to lunch, but I left there just as lost as when I came in. About two weeks later, I was just as lost when I was baptized because I never really understood what I was doing. I never understood the doctrines of, of grace and mercy. I lived a fake Christian life for, for a while. I, I had the Christian mask that I would wear and I would pretend to be religious. And I was probably about 16 at this age. And um, even then, sinful desires inside of me were growing. I can remember at, being at church and having sinful thoughts about other people there and other, other young guys my age. And I remember just telling myself, oh, it'll, they'll go away, it'll pass away. But yet it grew worse and worse as I went along. And sure enough, it wasn't that same year when in my late 16, being 16, I actually slept with the first male I ever had an opportunity to sleep with. And I remember at first being very shamed of it and repulsed by what I had done, but yet the sinful nature of me also was satisfied in, in the pleasure of the sin itself. And as time went on, I became more comfortable with it. And I just remember thinking that it was natural, it was normal, and that I was just doing something be I felt that guilt because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing at that age, but it was really because I was doing something against God. That's where the guilt came in. Before long, I got a job and I started rebelling really against my parents in pretty much every way I could. I turned to drugs and alcohol and was exposed to it at work. I wanted to try to do as much as I could 
as a teenager and, and live as much as I could and, and rebel against my parents without really having to rebel and move out of their house. Eventually, my parents did kick me out of the house. We had a big, big blowout and I ended up leaving. And I tried to clean myself up a little bit after that because it was hard trying to live on my own. So I tried to clean myself up and I thought, well, I'll join the Navy, which had always been my, my dream to be in the Navy. I wanted to be a sailor. I shipped out to boot camp and as soon as I got away from my parents, that was just like adding fuel to the fire. My sin really took off. I was, had an income, I had no parental people to answer to, I only had to answer to Uncle Sam and I was exposed in California to all kinds of sins. It didn't take long before I actually got in trouble with my sins. I let the, my sins, all of them, the drinking, the drugs, the sex, get me into a, a state where I actually had to go into the hospital and in the hospital they ran several tests on me and one of them was a drug test and they discovered pretty much all my my history of drug abuse up to that time and and also at that time my my sexual sins came out and that was forbidden in the Navy to be a homosexual. Within a few few months time my whole dream of being uh, in the Navy as a career was gone so I had nothing left to do but to follow my my gay friends at that time they were Canadians and they were living in the States but they were being going back to Canada so I followed them and I left my parents uh, I didn't tell them where I was going, I just left and went. And for about two years I, I lived it up there in, in Canada and I didn't tell my parents at all where I was at. Where I didn't even contact them for all they knew I was dead somewhere. And I remember times where I would be get very depressed and think, you know, is there nothing more to life than drinking and doing drugs and, and this sin? And I was at a party and everyone was inside and they were drinking and doing all sorts of things and I was out on the patio of the balcony and I I just I was so tired of fighting in life and so tired of all of it and I was so disgusted with myself that I I wanted to commit suicide and I told myself I could just jump off the the balcony and 22 stories later 23 stories later I would be dead and there wouldn't be any anything left so I decided I was going to do it and I really was going to do it. I felt to my heart that I just was tired of, tired of it all. So I, I got up to the ledge and I was going to jump and right before I threw my leg over the, the ledge I remember these thoughts just came out of nowhere and one of the thoughts was there's always hope in God and I needed to find God to find that hope. And then the next major thought that really hit me was that I couldn't do this because it was wrong. It was a sin to take life, even my own life. And then the last thought I remember thinking was that I couldn't dishonor my parents this way. So I cried a little bit more and I ended up backing away from the ledge and leaving the party and I actually never saw most of those people ever again. And I continued to live my life though in, in drinking and alcohol. I didn't really clean up myself or I, I tried to but it didn't really work. And I eventually left Canada and, and went back home. I, I got caught working illegally in Canada and I got sent back to Texas. And I remember when I got back to Texas, at first everything was good. I was glad to be around my family and everything, but then I started feeling guilty for my lifestyle around them and my drinking and, and all the things I was doing. I, I wanted so badly to to get away from them again. So my partner at the time was getting transferred and he's like, let's go to California. And I jumped at the chance to run, to get away from them, thinking that that would make me feel better. I could live my life how I wanted to. And so we went off to California. In California, things just, they didn't get any better. I wasn't a different person. I was just the same person I'd always been, just with a little bit more money now. I had a decent job. Um, I did all kinds of things I hadn't done before. I continued to decline in my sin and, and do more grievous, grievous things. I remember thinking if I could just, you know, try these other things, I, I, I would be happy, that that would make me happy, that I would be fulfilled, that I would be at peace. And even though with, I was never at peace with, with who I really was, there was always a part of me that 
deep down inside, I, I knew it wasn't right, but I, I still wanted to pursue it. It was who I had become. I continued doing drugs and drinking, and finally uh, I got really sick. I let myself uh, get dehydrated in it really bad, and I ended up spending New Year's Eve in, in the hospital with the IV drip, getting rehydrated. And I didn't realize it, but at the time I had pneumonia, and I left the hospital, and I left there and I was really sick. And the dehydration, getting hydrated, helped make me better for a little bit, but eventually the pneumonia caught up with me, and it, it ended me back up in the hospital. And I just remember my, my partner taking me into the hospital, and the next thing I know, uh, it was the next day, and the doctor was coming in and she was talking to me and she said that I had the worst case of double pneumonia she'd ever seen and I was massively dehydrated and had I not been brought in that I would have died. And I just remember I was grateful to God but I also remember thinking, wow, I'm so young and there's so many things I haven't done, so many sins that I haven't enjoyed. And so as I lay in the hospital the next few days recovering, I mean, I was grateful to God, I did say thank you, but not in the real earnest way, in the sincere way. I was grateful that I had another chance to go out and commit sins against God, sins against Christ. So as I lay in the hospital, I planned and plotted what I was gonna do first, how I was gonna fulfill my lustful desires. And sure enough, as soon as I was able, that's what I did. I went out and, and lived for lust, I lived for drinking, I lived for drugs, and before long, I was back in that depressed state again. Well, about this time, I, I started going to a, a political action thing, and there was a friend there who was a Christian, and he was asking me if I was a Christian, and I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been since I was 16 years old. And he asked me what my conversion story was, and. I think my exact words were, what is that? And I, I really had no idea what he's talking about. And he said, um, that's the story of how God saved you. So I relayed to him my walking down the aisle at church story and he seemed rather unimpressed and, and didn't really seem like uh, he believed it. And he kept asking me a few more questions and after he could sense I was a little bit irritated, he, he backed off, but not before telling me that he really didn't think I was a Christian. He knew my lifestyle, he knew I was a homosexual, and he, he was trying to kindly show me that I couldn't live in that lifestyle and be a child of, of God. I didn't understand that. My eyes were blinded by the devil. I was living in unrighteousness and I was suppressing the truth, as it says. I started listening to the radio show hosted by Todd Friel, and I remember thinking, as I was listening to them talking, he was saying something about people that that didn't agree with the Bible usually had a low opinion of Scripture. And so that got me to thinking, well, I really didn't have a high opinion of Scripture. I cherry-picked what I wanted to believe out of it. I, I wanted to believe I was a child of God, but yet I lived this lifestyle that was completely contrary to what He asked. I broke pretty much every sin there was. I had stolen, I had lied. <laughs> I probably told 50 lies every day and it never bothered me. I, I did drugs, I lusted, I fornicated, I did all these things that were contrary to what a true Christian should do. Well, I, I started paying more attention to, to the show and what he was teaching and comparing what I believed to be true to what the Bible said. And I started reading the Bible and I discovered that None of my beliefs matched what the Bible said other than Jesus Christ died on the cross. That was the only thing that really matched up to what I believed. I realized I had a God up here I was living for, a God that was okay with my sins. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10, you know, there are multitudes of, of sins. I'm not trying to just harp on just homosexuality. Every sin will separate us from God. Every sin will doom us to eternity in hell. It shows us how holy God is. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand how holy God is. We'll turn it around and look at what the Word of God says, but look at it from the backwards. An eternity, one soul's eternity in hell, paying forever. Punishment and torment will pay the wrath of God, will pay the fine against a holy God. That's how holy God is. He's infinitely holy, more than we can ever understand. 
And it's only Christ's righteousness that is going to save us from that damnation that's going to save us. It was about this same time that my, my partner at the time, who had knew I was professed to be a Christian, he was always fine with it. But it was about this time that I really started reading the Bible and paying more attention to, to Scripture and, and comparing myself to, to what the Bible said. It was about this time that he started really being threatened by this whole thing. And he, he, really, he really fought against me studying and, and reading the Bible. In fact, at one point, he became really verbally abusive and, and started calling me all these names and, and talking about Christians and actually talking about Christ. And I remember when he, when he talked about Christ, I remember something inside of me just felt the pain of the, how wrong it was. I knew that, that he was blaspheming the Lord who had gave, given us all life. And so I'm sitting writing his words down, and little did I know that the Lord was going to actually use that to really open my eyes to, to the truth of his word. So I kept studying his word and kept listening to the radio show, and I realized that that I really was living this, this life for me, not for God. I had never really been a Christian. I, at least I didn't think I was. I thought maybe, maybe I just re needed to rededicate my life. So I started praying to the Lord to please have mercy and, and show me the truth and, and show me you know, how to live for Him. And about this time, everything just kind of fell apart. The only, the only positive things was the Lord had taken away my desire for drinking. I no longer drank like I once did. He took away my desire for any sorts of drugs. I no longer did any drugs. I didn't even smoke pot anymore, which was really glorious. And I see now in hindsight that it was God's grace and God's mercy in, in giving me those things. And He was making my mind sober where I could be able to, to process and, and believe His truths. Once he opened my eyes to his truth, I just started delving deeper into Scripture, and I realized that, that I needed to get away from there, that there was no way I was going to progress in my faith, my, my budding faith in Christ, if I stayed there in that, in that environment. So I moved back to Texas, my, my sister and my mom. I tried, to, I tried to repent to God. I tried to call out for mercy, and I, I realized I wasn't saved, and I, I, I begged him to save me. but. I just wanted to keep one sin to myself. I wanted to keep homosexuality to myself. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, well, I'll find some way to justify it. I'll find some way to make it okay. I'll find some way to do it in secret. So the Lord obviously would never save me. And I spent from September 2008 up until December of 2008 crying out to the, Lord, uh, the God to God to, to save me. I prayed that He would save me, and He wouldn't save me. And that, I have a scripture here actually that He wouldn't save me until I actually repented of all my sins. I, I went to my, uh, my cousin's funeral in Amarillo, and where I'm from, his wife had died, and at her funeral she wanted the gospel preached. Well, the night before, I had watched a sermon by Paul Washer called The Shocking Youth Message. And in it, Paul Washer talks about how it wasn't a matter of all we've, that we've sinned, it's that all we've ever done is sin. And I realized that was true in my life. All I had ever done was sin. I had never really been converted. I had never done anything good. I may have been nice in, at times, but I was never... I never did anything but really sin against God. My whole life had been a sin against God. And I remember him saying that Jesus died for my sins, that he bore my sins on the cross. And I remember how it sank in that my sins were what put Christ on the cross. I was responsible for his death. He bore my sins, David's sins. At this time, I, I, I really begin to get a clear picture of what Christ was, what the cross was, and what he did on the cross. Up until this time, I'd never really understood what real repentance was, that it was a turning away from your sin, that it was more than just saying you're sorry. So up until that time, all I'd been doing was saying I'm sorry and trying to find some way to, to live in my lifestyle. But now I realize that I was without hope. There was no hope for me. 
without Christ. That I was doomed to stay in this lifestyle. I was doomed to, to, to live out in sin and then go to justice where I belong, to hell. So I cried out to God to save me. And I went to my cousin's funeral and I sat there and, and her last request was that one of them was that the gospel be preached. So I sat in her funeral and I listened to the gospel and I heard the glories of the cross and what Christ did. And it just sank into me right now that that, that could be me in the casket. And if it were me right then at that moment, I would be going to hell. I would be going where I deserve to go because all I'd ever done was sin. So I cried out to the Lord to, to forgive me and to just give me time to get home and to repent on my face where, the way He deserved. Later that night when everyone had gone and I was in my room alone, I got down on the floor and I confessed every sin that I could think of. I confessed my homosexuality. I confessed all my, my sins against God. I, all the ones I could think of. Everything. And I asked Him to forgive me for them and to help me. I asked for Him to forgive me of the secret sins, the ones I couldn't even think of at the time, the ones that I knew were sins to Him that I didn't even know about. I asked Him to please forgive me for how I'd lived, forgive me from running, forgive me from rebelling against Him. Because I had always known that there was a God and that there was a Christ, but I just never understood what it meant to be in Him what it meant to be redeemed by Him, what it meant to love Him, what it meant to, to serve Him, what it meant to be forgiven, what it meant to be regenerated. So that night I prayed and I begged Him, please, to have mercy, to, to give, forgive me, to help me. I didn't know how He was going to help me. I, I didn't actually even think it was possible. To be honest, I, I really didn't believe that He could help me. I'd never heard of anyone being saved from homosexuality. I'd never heard anyone with the hope in being redeemed from it. So I just prayed, Lord, I'm going to jump into this with faith in You. Faith that somehow you will, you will save me. That You will keep me from sinning. That You will make me able to stand the temptations. To stand what may come. And I went to bed that night not knowing if I was saved or not. But I woke up the next morning and I felt things were different. I didn't feel the guilt, the pressure of the guilt, the pressure of being under some sort of clock, the pressure of needing to make a decision, which had all been, the previous three months had all been that. They had been pressure and guilt and conviction. Now I know it to be conviction. So I knew something was different inside of me, but I still, part of me didn't believe that I could be saved from homosexuality. I still went on and I doubted the Lord. But then I found scripture here that says that I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalms 32, 5. And I remember thinking, finally I had, I had really repented. I, I understood what it meant to repent. I hadn't hid, kept anything hidden from Him. Even though nothing was really hidden from Him, I hadn't tried to. I put it all out there. And that's why I felt different that day. That's why I felt different in the coming days was because the conviction, the guilt was gone. He had lifted it because He had saved me. And every day from that day forward, I felt... I truly felt the, the desires for those things to fall away. And now I stand and wonder, two, uh, almost two years later, a year and a half later, thinking, wow, God is so good. Here I was, I, I, I didn't believe Him. I just leaped out in faith, and yet He did what He said He would do. He would take, me, take those desires away. He would make me a new creature, just like it says in His Word. He's given me a new heart with new desires. And I thank Him and I rejoice in what He has done for me. And I marveled at His goodness and His mercy to me and His long-suffering and patience. I feel compelled to, to share this scripture. I had read it before, obviously, anyone who's a homosexual and, and, and listened to preaching or read the Bible has discovered this verse before, but there was part of it I had never noticed before. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 
verse 9 through 10. And it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I knew that part. But verse 11, I had never known. I had never read before. And when I read it, I remember glorying in the, in the truth of it. And such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I realized that's what happened to me. I was finally justified by Christ. And I was made a new creation. I was predestined to be a servant of His, to, to serve God. And so now... I rejoice that he, He's given me that, that new heart, that new desire, the new desire to go out and to serve Him and to do His will and to, to live for Him. Sometimes I'm, I'm still tempted, but I know that there's, there's nothing wrong. There's no sin in being tempted. Even Christ was tempted. So I know that I can turn to Christ in my time of temptation. So I, I take comfort in knowing that. And I also take comfort in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I found that to be true. Every time I have rested in Christ's strength to overcome temptation, He has helped me. Every single time in every single instance, no matter what the sin was. But every time I would try to to make do with my own strength, in, in my own strength, I fall. So I, I'm not afraid of what the future holds because I know I'm, I'm made right with, with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, who, who suffered and bore the wrath, God's wrath, for me on the cross. I know that Jesus Christ has saved me from the power of sin and He can save you too. And my hope is that anyone watching this video will turn away from that lifestyle, will turn away from their lifestyle of sin, whatever it may be, and be made right with Christ, be made right with God. And it's only through Christ, through repenting of your sins and turning from them and casting all your faith and your hope on Christ, just as I did at that time when I just leaped out in a leap of faith to Christ and He caught me. And I remember thinking how impossible it was, but yet He did it. And I stand here today, a new creature in Christ, knowing that He has paid it all for me on the cross. And I have found my hope in Him. If you're not in Christ, you have no hope. There's no hope for you. So I pray that you would please consider the truths you've heard in this video. And please consider turning your life over to Christ. Surrender to Christ. Fall at the cross and surrender all your sins. Don't suppress the truth and unrighteousness as it says in Romans 1. We all, we all do those things. I did it for many a year even though deep down inside I knew it was wrong. Now looking back I, I realize that, that it was wrong. And that's the repulsion I felt at the beginning of it. So I pray that that will be true for you. That you will be forgiven in Christ. Christ paid, my, my, paid for my sins on the cross, my past sins, my present sins, and the sins I'll commit in the future. There's, only Christ can do that work on the cross. We can't do it ourselves. You can be freed from your sin. You can be truly saved. You can be truly set free from the bondage of whatever sin it is that's dragging you down, whether it's homosexuality, drinking, drug abuse adultery, pornography, whatever it may be, Christ can set you free from all those things. That's what He did on the cross. Romans 4.25 says that He was delivered to death for our sins and He was raised to life for our justifications. That's how we become justified through Christ's work on the cross. When heaven looks down at us now, when God the Creator looks down on us, He sees me through, through Christ, through Christ's blood. He sees Christ's righteousness imparted onto me. It's nothing that I, have, that I do or that I will do. It's only Christ that saves me. It's only Christ that can give me hope. It's only Christ that can bring true joy and happiness to my life. And I don't mean in a monetary 
monetary way. I mean in the way that, that brings true happiness inside with being right with God, being right with, with Christ, being a servant of Him. It's only through Christ that I felt that, that conviction and that guilt pass away. Without Christ, there's no hope. If you're without Christ and you're not, you're not saved, you're facing God's wrath, be it from whatever sin, homosexuality, drinking, alcohol, whatever it is, if, if you sinned one time, which we all have, you're guilty of breaking all of God's laws. So the only hope that you have is in Christ. It's Christ's redeeming work on the cross. So I, I ask you to please cry out to Christ. Cry out to God. Cry out to Him to, to open your eyes to the truth that can be found in Him, to His truths and His Word. It's only through Him, the God of this world, which is Satan, has you blinded to the truth. And it's only through God's calling to you, through God's taking the blinders off you, that you will see the truth that can be found in His Word the truth that is found in Christ, the truth that is found in the cross. And if you truly are seeking that, cry out to Christ. He is mighty to save, and He'll save you today. Jesus says that we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. If we're not born again, we're never going to make it. We're never going to see Him. We're never going to be free from the, the bondage of sin. It's only through Christ only through that regeneration, that being born again, that we can be saved. I want to read a quote from John Newton. It says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what I am is an undeserving sinner saved from, from God's wrath by Jesus Christ on the cross. And I thank Him every day for suffering with my, my, my running and my turning away. And I thank Him every day for, for calling out to me, even when I wasn't listening, even when I was running, He still cried out to me. And I thank Him for my salvation, and I thank Him for Christ and what He did on the cross. And I, I pray someday that those of you listening that, that are struggling with whatever sin it may be that separates you from God, that you will cry out to the Lord to repent for repentance and, and, and forgiveness and that you will truly repent and turn to Christ. If you're not saved, you need to examine your life, see that you need Christ, and that you'll never be happy with that. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. Albionist.com My name is David, I'm 44 years old, and this is the testimony of how Jesus Christ saved me from 27 years of homosexuality. I speak these things in love, not out of hatred. I speak these things out of somebody who's been there, who knows what it's like, who, who knows what it's like to, to live in that, who knows how hopeless it is. Sure, you may enjoy your life, you may enjoy aspects of your life, you may enjoy the sexual, aspects of it, the alcohol, what have you, but, but there's really no permanent joy in it. Eventually it goes away and you have to do more, you have to seek more. So I ask you to look for the real love, the real joy, the real contentment that can only be found in being made right with God through Christ, through Christ's work on the cross. So I speak these things from love, not, not from hate. I, I speak these things not in judgment, you know, I, I'm not judging somebody. I'm, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God is what's going to judge us. In fact, the Word of God is what says all these things are wrong. I'm only telling people what the Word of God says. 
Like somebody should have told me, my friend who did try to tell me, he tried to tell me in the, in the nicest way, in a Christian way, that I was living a lifestyle that was contrary to what God wanted, not just in my, my sexual orientation, but in every other aspect. He knew, I, he knew I was not really a Christian. So I speak these things in love, and I, I pray for your soul, and I pray that you will receive these things, and that you will cry out to the Lord to save other young guys my age. And I remember just telling myself, oh, it'll, they'll go away, it'll pass away, but yet it grew worse and worse as I went along. And sure enough, it wasn't that same year when in my late 16, being 16, I actually slept with the first male I ever had an opportunity to sleep with. And I remember at first being very shamed of it and repulsed by what I had done, but yet the sinful nature of me also was satisfied in, in the pleasure of the sin itself. And as time went on, I became more comfortable with it. And I just remember thinking, that it was natural, it was normal, and that I was just doing something. Be I felt that guilt because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing at that age, but it was really because I was doing something against God. That's where the guilt came in. Before long, I got a job and I started rebelling really against my parents in pretty much every way I could. I turned to drugs and alcohol and was exposed to it at work. I wanted to trouble you and to make you a new creature because he is mighty to save and he will save you. As I turned into my teens, we stopped going uh, quite as much. My parents started having problems and, um, and eventually my parents divorced and sometime later my mom remarried. And after she was remarried, we started going back to church again. And I remember being kind of glad that I was going back to church, but it was all superficial. I, I would listen to the hymns and get emotional and about that time, my friends started going down front and making professions of faith. And so one Sunday, I was moved by feelings and by the music and what my friends had done. And I went down front and made a decision for Christ. I didn't really know what I was doing or understand what was really taking place. I just knew something was wrong and all my friends had done it. So I felt compelled to do it. So. I walked down front and I sat down in the front pew and the deacon came over and told me I needed to accept Jesus into my heart and he told me to repeat this prayer. And I, I repeated the prayer and I remember thinking, you know, is that all there is to it? And the next thing I know, he's clapping me on the back and standing me up in front of the congregation and telling me that I'm saved. And everybody congratulated me on the way out and we all left and went to to lunch, but I left there just as lost as when I came in. About two weeks later, I was just as lost when I was baptized, because I never really understood what I was doing. I never understood the doctrines of, of grace and mercy. I lived a fake Christian life for, for a while. I, I had the Christian mask that I would wear, and I would pretend to be religious, and I was uh, probably about 16 at this age, and um, even then, sinful desires inside of me were growing. I can remember at, being at church and having sinful thoughts about other people there and other 